Holy Spirit upon us, and open the eyes of our hearts and our minds to the knowledge of thy gospel, for thou art a good and merciful and man be friendly, God. Amen. Amen. We were going to start talking about the uh, Holy Prophets today. Today being the Feast of the Holy Prophet Isaiah, it's uh, Isaiah's, it's appropriate. But uh, because of the uh, wedding this afternoon, we're going to make a little bit shorter. But um, the Old Testament prophets are particular importance because they're the ones who really lead up to the coming of Jesus Christ. And it's the kind of prophecies they gave that are important to remember. Sometimes people think of prophets as being people who foretell the future or some kind of soothsayers. But actually, the holy prophets are critics. They're the only people who have the real authority to speak to kings and emperors. And the kings and emperors would listen, at least in Orthodox countries. And uh, they, they, when Israel decided they wanted a king, because everybody around them had some kind of a king, and they thought, well, they needed a king for better defense, and so they'd be like everybody else. Before that, God had appointed judges over Israel. And uh, they were demanding a king, so through uh, their judge, prophet judge, anyway, uh, Samuel at the time, anyway, God said uh, to the prophet, well, you'll be sorry if you have a king, because he'll have take all of your sons to make them soldiers and warriors, They'll have to run in front of him behind his, his chariot and uh, give him all kinds of honors and things. And kings can tax, can levy taxes. So there'll be taxes for sure. Well, anyway, they wanted a king nonetheless. So Samuel went and chose Saul. Now Saul was, began his reign as a, as a decent king, but it seems that power really does corrupt people completely. So the, the, the ministry of the Holy Prophets emerged at the very time when everybody decided to have a king in Israel. And the prophets were given by God so they could censure and correct the king and, and criticize him to his face. Of course they had to suffer sometimes for it, but they did it. And that was um, the whole gift of prophecy. It simply was not about foretelling the future. It was about uh, telling what was wrong in the kingdom and wrong with the king and what the consequences would be if people didn't change and the king didn't change. So the, the problem at, at the time was in the Old Testament it was really a history of mankind's struggle with idolatry. There was always some idolatry coming into Israel and um, the prophets were trying to correct them and get rid of the idolatry. Some of the kings had a different kind of idolatry too. They had an idolatry for money and for power and for uh, control. And that, that can be an idolatry as well. So we see how the prophets were very often rather strange people. Uh, remember that uh, Ezekiel went nude through the streets and uh, one time dragged his possessions on a rope behind him. Another time he put a brick in the middle of the road, <coughs> sat down and besieged it with pebbles. All these were prophecies that he was giving to Israel. But he gave them in a rather startling way so that somehow they'd sink in. And uh, so they were called fools. But I wanted to say we, we had this whole tradition of New Testament prophets who behaved the same way and did the same things. And uh, this, uh, I'm going to give everybody a copy of this book on God's Fools. It's a history of actually New Testament prophecy, not all of it, but some of it, uh, from St. Andrew, the fool of Constantinople, uh, who was there at the time when the, when the Virgin revealed the, the pogrom, or the protection of the Virgin, with, with the, her omophorium spread out over, over Constantinople. And uh, there were a whole series of these people. And they usually appeared when there was some kind of a downturn or crisis in the life of the country. Even Ivan the Terrible was afraid of the fools for Christ. Uh, he knew they were prophets of God. And as vicious and savage as he was, he would back down in the face of the, of, of the holy prophets of God's fools. And uh, the first, now uh, each of these prophets that we're going to study at first, we'll, we'll look at 
the prophet and the king, or the kings who were ruling at that time, and see why the gift of this prophecy was so important at that time. Remember David, the king, took over uh, Saul as he gained more and more power, began to sort of lose his mind a little bit. Power ate him up, as they say. And uh, toward the end, he was uh, very ruthless and very brutal and vicious. And uh, so he then was killed in battle. And David became king. And David, one great thing about David was he struggled against all the idolatry. He, he kept Jerusalem pure of, of any kind of idolatry or false worship. And brought the, uh, he wasn't allowed to build the temple, the temple because of certain sins that he had. But he protected the Ark of the Covenant and put it in a special place. Well, when David had, uh, as you know, he fell in love with Bathsheba, who was married to Uriah the Hittite. So he arranged for Uriah the Hittite to be killed in, in battle so he could have his wife. And uh, a few other rather savage things like that that David did. And so Nathan the prophet appears, and he's the first great prophet that we come into contact with in the scripture. And Nathan the prophet went to David and censured him and called on him to repent. And we get the 50th Psalm from David's repentance. Have mercy on me, O God, according to thy great mercy. At Pomeli uh, is David's repentance for having Uriah, arranging Uriah's death. But it was Nathan the prophet who came to him and censured him and critiqued him and brought him to his knees in repentance. And this is going to be what the gift of the prophets are throughout the whole history until the end of Israel. And, and uh, the, um, well, until the end of Judea, really, because Israel disappears not long after, uh, and only Judea is left. But in the, the whole time, the most famous prophets we know, the prophet Eli or Elijah, the prophet uh, uh, Isaiah, um, Isaiah, we have, it's a long, long book by Isaiah. And Jeremiah is trying to save the kingdom from, from betraying God and, and being destroyed by the Babylonians and all. But in every case, the king gets power. Sometimes they start off very, very good. Solomon starts off very wise and uh, ends up filled with greed, filled with ambition, it taxes people almost to the breaking point and has forced labor among the people to build things that he wants to build, a lot of them just to his own grandeur and glory. Uh, so the, the prophets are really seldom actually foretell the future. And in fact, they don't really foretell the future. They tell what the consequences would be if you continue the actions the way you're acting. And um, so this gift of prophecy carries into the New Testament. <laughs> And you'll remember that um, in the Acts of the Apostles, you, you hear about Agabus the prophet, who warns the Apostle Paul. And Hermione, who was the daughter of Philip the deacon, who was a New Testament prophet. And we don't really know a great deal about her, except that she founded uh, drop-in centers for medical treatment of people who are traveling and became ill or injured and all. So this, this tradition of prophecy is, uh, the, the Russians recorded more completely the great fools for Christ. St. Basil, St. Basil's Cathedral in Red Square is not named for St. Basil the Great, it's named for St. Basil the Fool of Moscow. And it was built by Ivan the Terrible, and uh, when Basil would censor or tell Ivan that he was off base, Ivan would always repent. And uh, he, he was um, one of the most savage, cruel, destructive rulers in, in history. And yet, he would back off and bow before the fools for Christ. Because for all of his wickedness, he was also a believer. And uh, the uh, uh, fools for Christ, I'll, I'll give you the books. But the uh, thing is that the prophets could go to somebody as powerful as King David and say, okay, God says you're a man after his own heart, 
but uh, you keep falling away from it. You keep going into this darkness. You've fallen into the idolatry of power. You've kept all of the idols out of Jerusalem, but you brought in your own idols. Your power, your self-worship, and your lust for you know, other people's wives. Uh, these, are, these are forms of idolatry. And so Nathan the prophet censures him and, and uh, brings him to repentance. David can't quite make it. He keeps falling into various sins. None so severe as having Uriah killed. But in the end, he pays for it by having his own son rebel against him and his own son that is killed in the battle in this rebellion. And this is something that Nathan had warned him about from the beginning. Uh, so this is the kind of prophecies that we get. More warnings, or you censure a whole culture, a whole society, or you censure the leaders of the church or something. And uh, this is the, the duty of the, of the prophet in the church. And it's also what so many of the fools for Christ did. So I'm not, not going to be able to continue much today, and I notice none of, none of us are mentioned or are, are here. But next time we're going to talk about Nathan the prophet, and then what happens after Solomon's death, and the two kingdoms split apart, why, and, and the, the, the prophets who appeared at that time. One thing we do want to notice about all the prophets, and if you, you read carefully in the books of of Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and the others. The prophets were the defenders of the ordinary people. They were defenders of the poor against the rich. Uh, they were basically social democrats. <laughs> uh, and this kind of prophecy appears at a time when the kings, first of all, become a little bit power crazy, but then they form a group of aristocracy around them. And the aristocracy also begin to lord it over the people. Today our aristocracy is the monetary aristocracy. It's the top one of it's the top one percent of the top ten percent. They're a monetary aristocracy, and today it's necessary to censure the system because they they crush the poor under their feet. And they fight against everything that would help the middle class to the poor. They were willing to destroy the country, and many of them even to destroy the whole world by denying global warming and climate change and these things because they don't want their profits interfered with. And we've come to an economic system in which profits are sacred. The profits of corporations and the wealthy are sacred. And the poverty of the people they've taken the money from is a matter of cold indifference. So we have a, a kleptocracy. You know what uh, kleptos is? Yeah. <laughs> uh, kleptos is when you steal something. You keep stealing it. You, a kleptomaniac is somebody who can't resist stealing something. So we have a kleptocracy today. And uh, we also have this kind of um, monetary aristocracy. And this is something that the holy prophets all testified against. And yet we have evangelical Christians who think that the prophets of the wealthy are sacred and the poverty of the poor is a matter of indifference. And they're, they're saying this in the name of Christ. You can't do anything that interferes with the very richest, making more money and making the poor poorer. Uh, they, they hold this as it was a religious doctrine, these evangelical Protestants. But the holy prophets are all testifying against that idea. <coughs> And censuring everyone for uh, for this, the way the poor are treated, and for the wealthy getting more and more power and lording it over everyone. So you see, we live in an era where people claim to be Christian or claim to be a Christian country, but the whole system is everything that God had the prophets testify against and condemn. And uh, so we, we we need to see what it is that the prophets do and what they were talking about in it. So th that's kind of what we'll be discussing, particularly the rulers, but also the conditions of different countries at, uh, at, at the time when the prophet spoke. Um, you know, in, in, uh, sometimes it's not just about the ruler. Theodore and Nicholas Kochanov in um, 
was at Nogorod, they uh, lived on either side of the bridge. And the two sides of the city were always fighting each other. And sometimes they got quite vicious and people were killed. So Kochanov stayed on one side and Theodore on the other, and they would come to the bridge in the middle and fight each other all the time. And what, what they were doing was testifying to the people, I mean, you see how stupid you are, how foolish you are, why are you doing this? <laughs> and they were kind of testifying to them about their, their folly and the foolishness to make peace between the two sides of the city in it. And the same with Nicholas Salas, who's probably, in my mind, one of the greatest of the, of the New Testament prophets. And we call him fools for Christ, but he was one of God's prophets. And, you know, when um, the terrible came, he was in Novgorod, and he actually cooked people alive. And others, he slid them down a slope, and we cut a hole in the ice, and he slid them down the slope into the river, and they went under the ice and, and drowned. It was quite savage. When he came to Pskov, he was going to do the same thing. But Nicholas Salas was the fool for Christ in Pskov. And uh, he challenged Ivan the Terrible, came in on his horseback and with all of his soldiers. Of course, the people were trembling in terror. They'd all put out little tables with bread and salt to welcome him and try to appease him. But Nicholas Salas ran up on a stick horse, like children used to ride. They went around in circles on his stick horse and referred to Ivan the Terrible as Vanya, you know, little Johnny, like, like saying Yanni <laughs> instead of Yohan. And uh, ran off, and Nicholas, so the Terrible was, Ivan the Terrible was quite furious. So he went to the cathedral, and in those days every city had a liberty bell. Didn't originate in America. <laughs> every city in Russia had a liberty bell. They, they elected their own princes in many of these places. And uh, so Ivan was going to carry away the Liberty Bell uh, from the cathedral. But he went into the cathedral and he demanded that they serve him an Evan for his health, you know, uh, a little cannon. And uh, they did, they, so they served it with fear and trembling. And he came out of the cathedral and Nicholas Salas had a little, little room underneath the stair, stairwell that went up to the cathedral. And uh, he came out, Vanya, Vanya, come in, come in. And uh, so Ivan the Terrible was quite angry, but he went in. And it was during uh, post, during Lent. So Nicholas Salas threw a slab of raw meat down on the table and said, Eat, Vanyushka, eat. And Ivan said, uh, I'm a Christian, I don't eat meat during Lent. Ah, you don't eat meat. But you eat the flesh and blood of your subjects during Lent. He said, Now flee from the city before you have nothing upon which to flee. Well, Ivan stormed out. He was furious that he was going to destroy the city. Just as he came out, lightning struck his horse dead. And he remembered that the, uh, the prophet had said, flee before you have nothing upon which to flee. So he got up behind his adjutant and they galloped out of the city and the whole army left and scoff was fine. Nothing happened. Because he understood the power and that the prophets and the fools were special friends of God. And uh, so this is, we're going all the way up to the, uh, to the end uh, with the Holy Prophets and the New Testament Prophets. But I'll give everybody a copy of God's Fools. And those who are watching this online, of course, you can, synapsospress.ca, you can order a copy. But uh, it's well worth reading because it shows, and if you want to take the framework for the God's Fools, read the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel? And you'll see how close the fools were to Prophet Ezekiel, in particular. So, there it is.